Well, can I help you? Listen up. I'm bringing you the best content to ever exist in the door to door industry from sales, leadership, recruiting, and personal development. Well, why would I need that? Because never before have we been able to collaborate with the top experts in their industries, sharing their secrets and techniques on what makes them the best. We. Who, who are you? I'm your host, Sam Taggart, creator of the DDD Experts and DDD Con. Is there a place we can sit down? Well, come on in. All right, everybody. Welcome to the DDD Podcast. I've got Asim Hafiz, who is a longtime friend, and been, I worked with you back in what, 2014? 15, 15. And we go way back, and he's moved on to bigger and better things, and obviously gone and crushed it. So it's fun to kind of see it full circle. You were in Cutco. He was uh, top. What was the divisional manager? Regional? How, was I was it? one of the youngest in the in the company. Yeah, one of the top. I was the youngest. youngest there or something. And uh, in Cutco, and how many knives? How many how many millions of dollars of knives? <laughs> I don't know. How many knives did you slip? A lot of knives, dude. It was I don't know. It was millions every year. I don't know. Millions every year. I mean, I don't know how many million. I can't recall. Crushed it. So he's all the way here from Connecticut, right? Yeah. And uh, flew in just for me, right? Of thank, course. Thank you. Just for you. Thanks just for coming for you, in. Of course. Um, no, honor to have you on the show. Like this is this is exciting. So just because of like we can banter about some fun little stories probably on this <laughs> yeah. for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we, we're sitting here right before the podcast. We get in here and it's like some good stories of murder in the dark in, the, <laughs> in this house. It's yeah. like it I'm like oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Good yeah. job. So yeah, um, I was pulling up and I was good. This place looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As the leading distributor of structural pest control. Univar provides training, services, and an arsenal of products to help you grow. Our 80 years of experience and industry-leading resource, PestWeb.com, provide unmatched opportunities for your company to succeed. Learn more at PestWeb.com or call 1-800-888-4897. So tell us a little bit how you got into the direct sales. Like, we'll start even Cutco. Like, what year was that? Tell us a little bit about kind of how you got introduced. Um, You know, I was, uh, I just graduated high school. It was like the first summer of my life where I didn't have other obligations like sports and so on and so forth and um, at the time I it, I just uh, I just lost like my grandma at the time so it was just I was in like a really weird spot and I didn't have anything to do throughout the day so it was just like I should probably get a job and I saw a sales job advertised and I ended up going in and applying I was a pre-med major had nothing to do with sales at the time and I think what I fell in love with was just the team atmosphere I think sales gives you that, where it kind of feels like a second Sport. family. Yeah, um, and then it also just the, it brought up my competitive nature, even though it wasn't very good at first. But I was still, uh, whenever a lot of people when they're competing, you kind of forget about the pain, you know. Like, or some people, for like me, and I'm sure a lot of people are like this, where I just can't work out for the sake of working out. But if I'm competing for something, all that goes away. So, did you do CrossFit and that kind of stuff? No, I, it's, I that don't. gets like competitive too. Is it really, I've done it a couple times. Okay. All, my my theory is just show up and throw up, right? So, <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> not very, I'm not I'm not I'm not very good. That's I go awesome. every once in a while, um, but I don't really do that as much. But it's definitely easier uh, when you're competing. I, I, you can never say it doesn't feel like work, but. It, that feeling subsides a little bit. So. Yes, yeah, so, and you competed at national levels in Cutco. You were yeah. national levels at Vivint, national levels at Alder, and you've always shined and been in the top percentile, right? And over the over this podcast, I really want to dive into. So, if you're listening to this, we're going to dive into like a lot on recruiting because that's like one of your biggest strengths yeah. is. You know, when we worked together, it was like, I'll come, I'll recruit guys, you train them. Yeah. I'll recruit guys, you train them. Yeah. And most people that listen to this, they're either managers, CEOs, upper management, and they're always like, how do I go recruit more guys? How do I dive into that? And so in this podcast, so stay tuned, we're going to dive into basically some different principles on recruiting. Yeah. And But before we before we jump into that, I, I, I want to know kind of what has been your – like the biggest why, like why stay in direct sales? Like what, what, what keeps you in it? Like that's a good question. I, um, I, I think what's kept me in the direct sales thing is we get a chance to work with a lot of young adults. Um, and I know, and maybe this is just me trying to pass it on in a way, but I know in my life, like between 18 to 23, when I was at Cutco and I had an amazing, uh, amazing manager and he was just there for me through so many of my, things that I was working through, like emotionally maturing and becoming an adult and being, it's like really my first professional mentor. Um, and in my opinion, I think that's one of the biggest things that people need nowadays is just having their first real professional mentor that can 
help them take the next step in their career and their life. Yeah. And, you know, and I think a lot of us go back to our first mentor for whoever that was for you. And who was one of your first mentors? Don Hill. Don okay. Hill was my division manager. Big shout out. If Big shout out, Don. Don. Uh, he was my first. Uh, he was my division manager. He helped me through all. You know, and I just probably did all kinds of dumb, immature things, and he just coached me on how to handle certain things professionally and um, learned so much in that experience. So I think part of it is to pass it down because you just see so many people in the 18 to 22 range that don't have any guidance don't really have that mentor thing at home and if they do have mentors they're just telling them to get another job making 30 40 grand a year it's like we all know life's bigger than that you know if you were to add up all the people you've maybe now mentored since you've been in the space how many people do you think you've recruited over the years <laughs> that's uh i don't know probably uh Kaka is a high recruiting model yeah and, and, I mean, and, and just being transparent it's a high recruiting model um, and so, that's why we got you on the podcast. That's right, why, no, that's why no, that, no, if you're no, listening, when he says it's a high recruiting model, it's probably because he's embarrassed to say how many people we probably recruited. Yeah, I mean, with my like division over the years, we probably like signed, you know, verbally accepted. I don't know, fifty, sixty thousand, and people that went through three days of training and tried to create a sale. Uh, my best guess is around like ten thousand or something like that. Well, wow. not obviously all of them didn't stick or whatever. And but I, that's I huge. That. I mean, but to, to go through interview, get them through the door. I mean, there's a process behind that. Right. And honestly, Sam, I think the biggest thing um, that we can all do if we want to get better at recruiting is just get more people through the door. Because if you just get a lot of people through the door, even if you're terrible, you'll naturally start being like, okay, that worked, that didn't work. Yep. But where people are under trouble is... They only have like their five buddies that they're going to talk to, and they're very bad at recruiting when they're new. <laughs> and then it ends there. And then it ends. And then you're like, okay, I'm finally starting to figure out what to say, but I don't have a never ending pipeline. So, yeah. and, um, and a lot of people think that once they get to that five, that road into done. five, they're done. And it's like, right. oh, but I don't have a network. And it's like, or I'm old, or I'm not in college anymore. Or, and the know. problem is, like a leader for like, you know, even from like a company perspective, I always said the problem with that type of recruiting is essentially the people that become managers are just the ones that happen to have friends that are looking for jobs. Yeah. Where they, you might have had other people in your company that are better managers of people, they're more caring, they're better trainers, but they just didn't happen to have people in the network looking for work. Yep. So that's why they never got promoted, which is kind of crazy to think about. Like it's important. Some of our most talented managers are not actually managers right now because we haven't taught them systems and how to have people walk in the door consistently. Yeah, so that kind of segues me on. I have a question. So yeah. remind me to bring up this story or question at the end. We'll okay. just dive into. All we'll right. dive I don't into know what story. This is. Uh, it'll be good. Okay. Uh, but we'll dive into more. How do you find more people? Let's sure. start there because as as we're on that train, um, most people say, "Well, okay, you tell me that I stop at my five. Right. Or don't but stop don't, at my yeah, five. Or I don't. Yeah, don't stop at my five. But how do I go? and start getting my 10,000. You know what I mean? Where do I tap into bigger audiences? How do I do that? I think um, the first thing, and um, it kind of goes along with one of the points that we're going to talk about, but um, it would just be having an a attitude that there's people looking for better work everywhere. And I think if you have that attitude, it's easy to see them. Um, so one of the things that's always, that I used to preach to my managers at Kaka, and those preached to me that I learned from somebody was, uh, my job is really simple as a recruiter. It's just to make sure everyone that has a pulse within this given territory know that I'm hiring. After that, some people will apply, some people won't apply, and that's no big deal, right? So wherever I am, whatever county you're in, Utah, Utah County for me was Hartford County, Connecticut, right? My job was really simple. It's like, hey, I just want everyone that has a pulse in this area, these one million people, I just want them to know that I'm hiring and there's an opportunity available if they would like to apply. Uh, so when you have that mentality, I think it's easier to open up the book. It's like, okay, well now, how do I make sure they everyone, no, right? Because, and it's okay if somebody comes and checks it out and it's not for them, like I'm totally okay with that. Hugging a high five. Yeah. What drives me insane, and this is like the biggest thing that drives me insane. I'm sure it's very similar for salespeople, but for me, the biggest thing that drives me insane is even like when I was driving here today, I bet you within like a half a mile radius of my car, I probably drove by like five people that are 100 to 300 account reps and alarms that want a new job that, that are just like ready to sign, but they just don't even know I exist. Yeah. And they don't know that the opportunity to have exists. So to me, that's what drives me insane. Yeah. Because it's like, you can't recruit the people that don't know you're recruiting. Right. <laughs> you right. I mean? So the first thing is just like getting as many people to know that, that you are recruiting. And so the next question becomes, 
well, how do people look for jobs? I think instead of me even just giving the answers and I'll give you some, some really good pointers, but I think what's even more important for people to do, they'll give them bigger breakthroughs, is to actually think about that. It's like, well, what do people do that are in sales when they look for a job? Like, where do you even go, right? Like, Yeah, it's starting with go? working on their end. Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in your shoes. It's like, well, where do people, like, think about that. If somebody wasn't working, like, just sales and you could just go talk to a different company, it's like, well, how do people find a job? Like, is it, do you go online? Do you Google it? Like, I don't know. I've never thought about that. And then you really start thinking through that. And then you start, even something as simple as, if you go to Google and you just put jobs in whatever town you're in, you're going to have a bunch of things pop up. And that's how a lot of people look for work. They just go to Google and they say, jobs hiring in whatever town. Yeah. Right. And then you start thinking of, uh, well, where are people that are always looking for work? Like college kids are always looking for work. Yeah. And where, well, where, how do college kids find out? Well, usually through career fairs. So we should go to career fairs and ask them what are for our opportunities to, what are the opportunities we have? To, to, and this is all I say, it's like, hey, I just want to know what are the different opportunities you guys offer for me to just let students know that we're hiring. So you go to the career, who's the person you usually talk to? Whoever is at <coughs> the head of the career services or whatever. And I'm like, hey, I just, we have some opportunities available. We just open up, you know, a local thing here. We have some openings. I know there's some students who are looking for work. I just want them to know we're hiring. How do I just let them know that we're hiring? What are my options? And an easy one would be doing career fairs. Okay. That's where a lot of people go. Internship fairs. Um, even just setting up like info tables there. Uh, sometimes they'll even let you put up posters. You know, it says hiring, text me if you're looking for work or whatever. You can just make up the craziest bootleg poster in the world and it doesn't matter because the point is just people know that you're hiring. Yeah, so have everybody in the town know you're hiring. Yeah, everyone in the area know you're hiring. So colleges, you hit it that way. Um, if somebody, if you want to, if maybe your target audience isn't college. Yeah, kids. let's say you're post-college kids. Yeah, so it's like, well, where do post-college kids go to look for jobs? Like, a lot of them go online. So what are the online job boards? Is it Indeed? Is it ZipRecruiter? Is it Monster? Is it all those? Like getting in contact with them, seeing what their pricing options are, putting stuff up there. Um, but the other thing is though, with some of that stuff, I think sometimes people get gun shy because it yeah. costs money. Yeah. Right? And, and it's like, yeah, absolutely. Like some of those things cost money, but if we want to have systematic recruiting, we need to be able to invest in sources of leads that are never going to die. So how do you, like... What are some good techniques that you found when you're posting an online ad? Sure. Like, you know, we're a commission-based job. Yep. And most people are scared to be like, well, we knock doors and there's no guarantee. So come work for me, right? Yeah, so yeah. How, do you, how do you phrase your ad to like really attract the people that you're looking to attract? Right. I mean, it's, it's very much like a sale, right? So you want to present the value prop and you want to save the expense until you already had a chance to build value. I think one of the things that um, sometimes the sales industry forgets is that most jobs don't tell you how much they'll pay until you go to an interview. It's a very rude question to ask. So if you want like a nine to five job, a very rude question to ask someone would be, how much am I gonna get paid? And even if you do ask, a very common response is, well, it depends on your experience and so on and so forth. And that's something that would be covered with the manager after we interview you, see if you're even possibly a fit. Okay. Right? So, and that just goes along with like, you just wanna be consistent with what the non-sales industry does. So even in the pay, you can give a range if you'd like, you know, but give a range. I think that's realistic. I think that's another thing with recruiting is sometimes people just present like the top 10%. Um, and when you just present the top 10%, you'll have people come out. You'll, you can sign a lot of people doing that. Way. You can sign a ton of people just saying, you know, like Sam Taggart sold 400 this summer and look at his check and you'll sign lots of people. They'll get super excited. But the problem is when they're two weeks into the job or a month into the job and because they'll say Sam Taggart made 300 yeah. grand for the summer or whatever, right? 200, 300 grand or whoever made a crap ton of money. When they go home, they're going to say, okay, I'm not Sam Taggart, so I'm not going to make 200 grand, but I think I can make 100 grand. Well, it's 100 grand divided by 16. Oh, that still comes up to, I don't know what the math is, yeah. like five, six grand. So they're like, oh, cool. So I'll make five, six grand a week. That means, that means I'll sell this much. I'll sell 10 a week instead of 20 a week like Sam. And I'll do great. One month in, they've sold four. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think four in the first summer for a brand new rep that's never sold before is awesome. It's like, hey, you're doing good. You're progressing. You're getting better. It's just a matter of time. But what, when they should be thinking, man, I'm doing good and I'm progressing, they're sitting there thinking, man, I suck. Because their expectations were set so high. So I think yeah. another thing in recruiting is setting realistic expectations. So even when I do you know, talk to people once they come in and I've had a chance to meet with them and stuff and I tell them like, hey, here's the numbers. Usually the way it's gonna work is you'll get zero or one in your first week. 
um, and then you'll get one or two, and then you'll get two or three the following week, and you'll get three or four the following week. That's usually how it progresses. Could you be the person that does six in your first week? You could, like that's happened. Um, you know, might you be the person where it takes two weeks for you to get your first deal? For sure. But this is usually what happens. If somebody follows the blueprint we give them, you usually get zero or one in their first week, uh, you know, and then maybe one or two in their second week and so on and so forth. But now even if somebody only gets one deal in two weeks, they're like, okay, well, I sold one this week. This is my one week. My, now I got to do two next week. And yeah. they're progressing. That so I think sense. that's a really, really, really big part of it is a lot of people just throw out these massive numbers and expectations. And when they sign people, they come out and then their reps quit. When their rep quit, it kills their conviction in recruiting. And they're like, oh my God. Uh, I shouldn't like, recruit anymore because the recruiting just, doesn't work. Yeah, and recruiting doesn't work. Yeah. Recruiting doesn't work. It's that we, we set the wrong expectations. Yeah. So what other things on like an online post or a job fair do you find that's effective to attract people? So I, I think, Sam, the biggest thing is like whatever we say at the job fair or whatever in any kind of advertising – has to be consistent with your culture because the goal is not to have people sign the goal is to have people stick yeah right so if your culture is that you do one meeting a week or whatever then let people know that up front if you can't commit to that then don't say that you'll do that right so if your culture is that you guys grow and yada 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 and you read a lot of books and personal growth books then great let people know that but you have to go through, well, this is what these guys' experience is going to be, so I'm going to present what the experience is actually going to be. So this way, people that are attracted to that kind of experience will come work with me. People that are not attracted won't come work for me. But the problem becomes, if you put on a, 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 a front, I guess, right, when you're recruiting, you'll have people that are attracted to that type of personality. And then you end up being a different person yeah. in the first month, and then you're like, what's, what's going on? So I think... Tricked. Yeah, they feel tricked where the reality is if you're just transparent. You might not have attracted that kid, but you would have attracted the other kid that would have stuck it out with you. So I think what the post says and all those little things what you tell people, it has to be different for every person uh, because it has to be true to who you are. Okay. Right? So if somebody loves murder in the dark, right, like yeah. playing games and board games, yeah. then great. That should be part of what you tell people. And there's people that are just going to be like, oh, man, these people play board games every week. I love that. And they'll, they'll come hang out, right? And there's other guys that are just like, dude, we like lift weights every Tuesday, right? And some, there's going to be some guy that's like, this is the perfect crowd for me, you know? Yeah. But I just think it has to be consistent is the biggest thing. It's important. Yeah. So what about guys that are like currently in a good job? Yep. It's like, let's say you're, you're more headhunting. Let's say the guy's already making six figures or the guy's in a stable spot. How do you target those people that aren't necessarily looking for a job, but it's like, man, you'd be really good at this. Yeah, I, I think you just, the first thing I think it goes back to is if you approach anyone in recruiting, I think you have to do it with like clarity in your heart, right? If you're just recruiting for, hey, I'm going to recruit these people so I build my team, um, I think sooner or later people can see through that. And I think, you know, like dogs are the perfect example. Like dogs can't communicate, they can't talk to you or whatever, but just the way they look at you, you can tell they care or if they're pissed, Yeah. right? So I think people can feel your intentions and your your emotion. Not I'm not trying to go all spiritual, but I'm just saying with like body language and just the, the feel it creates. So whenever we approach people, I think if we make sure we're not doing it with just like I'm going to recruit people so I can build my team, then I think people can tell like those are your yeah. intentions. You're directly or indirectly looking at them with dollar signs in your eyes. But so what's you, the alternative? I guess the alternative is you sit there and you say like. Let's say it is Sam Taggart, right? And I'm like, okay, sit down. And I say, here's all the, th the reasons why I think this opportunity would genuinely be better for Sam. And I'm only going to talk to him because I think it will actually be better. And then if I do talk to Sam, I say, hey, Sam, I have something. You know, honestly, if, if you're nervous, tell him them. Just tell him that straight up. It's like, honestly, bro, I wasn't sure if I should talk to you about it because, you know, I know you're doing good, but it was just one of those things where I thought it might be a good fit for you if you want to check it out. Cool, I'll tell you about it, but I don't want you to feel like you have to do it just because I'm working here. And I think that's big. With your friends, like, don't strong arm them. Don't, like, make them feel dumb for not working with you or whatever. Like, it's just like, hey, man, like, check it out as a friend. I just felt obligated to, like, tell you about it. 
after you check it out, if you say no, like hug and a high five, we're still going to be friends. I think we and, and we go back to the principle of you want everyone knowing you're hiring. Yeah. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. subtle way to say, I'm hiring. Yep. You'd be good at this. Check it out. If check it's it out. Cool, if, if it's not, if it's not. A really unfair. good rule of thumb if you want to attract top talent is I found that there's three trends um, in people that are working, three really big pain points. Okay, and I try to hit this one when I'm work, uh, trying to work, I guess, working with somebody who's a non-student. Uh, one's that they're not making enough money, right? And I'll just tell them straight up. So if someone's like sitting down with you, if we're meeting, I'm like, Sam, here's three big things that I've seen in the work, workplace. Correct me if I'm wrong, but here's just my opinion. One is that they're not making enough money. They're also, man, I wish I was making a little more money. Um, second is that there's no upside where they are. Like they feel like even if they're making good money, they're stuck at a dead end job. And as human beings, when we're not progressing, we start like checking out mentally. So they're like, oh, I'm making good money, but I'm kind of like checking out mentally. And the third one is they're making good money, they're progressing or whatever, uh, but they just never have time to enjoy their life. Like they don't enjoy the lifestyle they're living. So, um, you know, a good example would be most corporate America or whatever. Uh, the U.S. standard is two months off. Uh, two, no, two months. That'd be great. Two weeks off. That's a Australia. Year. Yeah, that's, that's Australia, Italy. Yeah. Why do you think some countries? It's I like think Italy is optional to show up to work one day a year. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, but in the U.S., it's two weeks. And when you do the math on it, you really think about somebody's working from twenty to seventy. Let's say over fifty years of their life, they're going to get to have two years of their life that they like enjoy and do what they. To like doing, which is nuts to think about. So I just say, hey, those are the three pain points that I've seen. Um, shoot me straight. Um, which one is it for you, if any of them? And if not, I totally get it, right? And then they'll just be open. It's like, you know what, dude? Like, you're right. Like, I and I like when I was at Cutco, for example, I was doing great, I was making money, but I was starting to feel a little bit like a dead end because I was like, oh, I can't really get to the next <coughs> promotion up. This is kind of where I can yeah. get. And I, and it wasn't that I wasn't like happy. I was just one of those situations where I was like, I at least want to take a sh- like, at least want to swing for the fences. Yeah. Like I'm not saying it's going to work out amazing or not, but you know. So um, I think with those three things, it really opens up a gamut of who, like, what people tell you and, and how you can recruit them, but like do it with I like purity that. in your heart. Yeah, and it's an, it's a, it's more of an ask versus let me tell you, you're probably really unhappy. With your job, it's yeah, like, which is like I, I, doing I, more. I like and, it. Like, yeah. and by the way, I tell people, it's like, hey, listen, man, if, if you're like genuinely happy with all three of those, I'll tell you what we have. Maybe but who work. knows? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Look, let's stay friends. You're cool. Like, I, I want you to hold me accountable to have those standards. And I think that that's also important to talk about. You might talk to him that one year, and then in a year, he's like, now I ran into the dead end. Right, and if you're continually keeping a relationship because you care about him, all of a sudden when he runs into this dead end, he's like, "Yeah, I realize what you're talking about, where I'm stuck and I can't ever really grow anymore." Right, and, I, and I've had that happen too. Where somebody will reach out to me later and they're like, "Oh, dude, like, hey, do you want to chat?" And I'm like, "Hey, I'm, I'm totally open to it." But it keeps going back to the same thing. I think it's important that, like, Sam, when people don't have a lot of people that they talk to, they um, subconsciously they end up manipulating and kind of twist in arms to get them to sign because you just don't have that many options yeah right so that's like if you're a sales guy and you're doing door to door if i was like hey here's the only five people that you can sell like you might end up selling somebody even though it's not what's best for them yeah so, but when you open up the funnel it allows you to just be transparent and genuinely like genuinely only bring on people where you think it's a good fit for them cool so let's kind of shift gears and talk about your four mindsets of recruiting, which cool. kind of this segues us perfectly into that. And I thought it was really interesting, this this topic of the four mindsets. So kind of tell us a little bit about what it is, and let's dive into each one. Cool. Well, I think um, the biggest thing with a lot of the recruiting, the, the, the how-tos, I, I know a lot of people want the answers to the how-tos, but more important than the how-tos is having the right mentality. Because if you have the wrong mentality, then... No matter what, you know, you know how to do one or Well, it, go, it goes to the same thing as selling. Most people, they come shadow me and they're like, what? I remember you were like, Sam, you're not very good at training. 
Because right. you say something different every, every time. time. <laughs> I was like, because I, I recorded some of Sam's trainings and I was like, he said something completely different. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, you're like, you're stuck. And I'm like, guys, it's not what you say. Right. It's the mindset of what you're doing. And then, you know, it. and he went over the balloon thing and the, yeah. the whys. And it's like, okay, that, made, that makes more sense. So I think that's, that's spot on. Um, I think the first and most important one is conviction. Um, and with me, conviction, not the, I think the thing that makes it easiest to recruit people and approach people is not just conviction in the people that will succeed, but conviction in people that the industry would label as quote unquote failed, right? Because in sales, you'll naturally have X amount of people it just won't work out for, right? And that's okay. And we have to accept that instead of like hide it. I think a yeah. lot of people like try to push that aside. So if we can have conviction in people that, you know, do sales for a couple of months, let's say, and it doesn't work out for them. Um, if we can have conviction that it was still a good experience for that person, then we can comfortably have conversations with a lot of people. Yeah. But if we have this thing made up where it's only a good experience if somebody sells 100 deals or whatever deals, then it's hard to approach people because you're looking for like that one person that might be able to sell 100. And I don't know about like everyone else, but I've had a really hard time trying to find who's going to sell 100 and who's going to sell two. Yeah, the person that surprises you the most and then, the, you know, and you're just like... Yeah, you just don't know who's going to, like, because everyone's a superstar until they face rejection and objections and, yeah. and adversity, right? So um, so for me, what I always focus on is even when I'm recruiting, I tell people this all the time, like, hey, for me, the biggest thing is, like, who you become in this process is more important than what you make. Like, absolutely, you make good money. But what I found in sales, and I'll tell people this quite often, it's like, what I found in sales is that it exposes our weaknesses. Um, so it exposes, like, for me... I know it uh, forced me to uh, manage my emotions better, as an example. But like managing emotions, it's not like a work thing. The way I was thinking about it, the way it's helped me is like, because I learned to manage my emotions better, I see it's helping me in my, my life, right? So somebody when I'm married and I have kids and stuff, and right, my wife's going off on me for something. It's like, okay, remember when, like, okay, I know how to manage my emotions, and you kind of yeah. go through that. So I think... Um, something like managing your emotions, something that helps people out in the long run. I mean, there's a reason. What's the divorce rate in the U.S.? Something like sixty percent. Yeah, sixty percent. Yes, because because people, the first time people face all these tough situations is with a lot on the line. And I'll tell people all the time, it's like I'd rather have you face tough situations when the only thing you have in line is like an account. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's let's, a good way to put it. Let's, yeah. let's have you learn how to handle your emotions or face the tough customer or figure out how to be motivated to work or whatever because you know in sales you're an independent contractor and in life whether you believe it or not you're an independent contractor like nobody can <laughs> that, do anything i love that in life yeah. you're an independent contractor yeah, yeah. Like, nobody's there telling you you have to do the dishes or you have to take care of your kids or you have to go see the aunt that hates you or whatever but like but you're learning how to have like you make the decisions in, in your time right so I think um, that's a big part is they really focus on connecting whatever they're doing um, with the things that they're going to learn. They're going to serve them for the rest of their life. Even if, and I said, worst case scenario is you work here and you at least find out what your weaknesses are so you can work on them well past the time yeah. you're here. And when you can do that with clarity, I think it really helps a lot. And I think people can, um, people appreciate it and, and it's also easier for them to even get through the tough times when they are there. Um, and looking so, at it from that perspective, you're way more confident recruiting anyone yeah. than, ah, what if he sucks and fails and goes home like the last four guys? Right. Because that's usually the, the, the mental roadblock that we all run into recruiting. Yeah. It really is. See, one of the things, I don't know where I picked this up. I'm sure I learned it from someone. Um, but one of the things that I feel like has helped me and, and I would challenge you guys to do is even when you do have people leave or somebody who didn't have a great summer, um, just at the end of the summer, just – have them write down a quick letter. It's like, hey, if it's okay with you, I just write to have you write down the things that you learned about yourself this summer and how you feel like that's going to serve you up for the rest of your life because um, it cool. helps, helps me better understand what we're doing well. It also helps me better understand what we could do better to add value to other people's lives. Love that. Right? So I think that, that will do it. And if you sometimes, like, I, I have, like, different screenshots and stuff people have sent me. Like, I save in a separate folder because there's times where we all go through that, like, oh, man, like, I'm, I'm going through a rough pass and I'll just kind of start reading through all the appreciation texts and messages I've gotten. And I'm like, dude, like I've had a chance to impact so many people's lives in a positive. Why would I, you know, deprive this person of it because somebody else said they weren't interested. So I think that's a big part of it. And then with the conviction, it's just, it also goes along with what we were talking about is just learning to, 
I think in recruiting, we need to learn to add value to people's lives outside work. Um, where you have no direct benefit coming back to you, like zero direct benefit coming back to you. So whether it's teaching them how to uh, budget better, whether it's like being there for them when they go through a tough time uh, in their personal life and genuinely with clarity in our heart, taking on that mentorship role, but actively saying, okay, what am I going to do to add value to this person's life that's outside work? Yeah. Um, and to me, that's also what creates crazy loyalty in the long run is when people know you can do that. So that's, that's a big one. It's probably the biggest one. The other one we talked about before, which was having an abundance mindset. So this is number two, right? Yeah, number two, abundance mindset. Um, and all that is is what we talked about before. There's millions of people that are looking for work. Um, we need to embrace that, that there's millions of people looking for work. And it's just the only difference is that they don't know that we're looking to hire. So we just need to let everyone know with a pulse in our territory that they just need to know we're hiring. We can do it respectfully. We don't need to like sell them. We just need to make them aware that we're hiring and from that X percentage of people will naturally be interested you know what's the sales stat like if, I, if you talk to 100 people one of them will just happen to be looking for whatever it is yeah. you're, you're, you're pitching right so uh, I think that's a really easy way to wrap your head around that uh, oh, the, uh, here's a, this is a big one in this industry is make a list of every single stereotype you have in this industry like I every like stereotype this. you have like make that list uh, girls um Guys that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's inner city. Maybe it's that they look a certain way. Maybe it's the, they're not LDS. I don't, I don't know, yeah. you know. Whatever stereotypes you have, um, and every, all of us have them, but it's being honest with ourselves that we have stereotypes that hold us back. So make a list of those. And then next to it, hi, how are you? Family came uh, I know. Oh, my. Uh, so after that, so you make that list. And after that, I want you to write down names of people that fit that stereotype that succeeded. Right? Okay, I like so this. So the next time you have that like thought, so like girls is a classic example. Yeah, right? so like, girls, girls can't sell, yeah. All right, and just so you know, like my team, about 40 to 50% of our sales are going to be girls. And that's the story uh, I want to bring up later. Right. Uh, but And it's not just that one girl, but I have yeah. another girl that's going to do like 150, another girl that's going to do like 120, another girl that's going to do like 70. Wow. So um, you just make a list of people that fit your stereotype that, you know, uh, there's a guy that we have on, in our company, right? It's like not the perfect English, not the anything, or he thought a lot of the stuff, he's like, you know, fluent Spanish guy, right? Uh, not like the perfect guy that you think, like ripped 300 accounts in his first year. But I think when we awesome. make a list of all the stereotypes and then write names next to them, it's easy for us to approach those people again. Because you're like, oh, wait a second, I'm just being silly, I just didn't know that's example. Yeah, because we sometimes like dequalify certain people. Absolutely. And it's like, that guy could have been really good. It's, and it's honestly, a lot of stuff that I'm talking about is the same stuff that a lot of uh, you guys and, and us were really good at in selling. What do you teach people in selling all the time? Yeah. Don't prejudge. Yeah, right? That guy that you thought had a bad that. credit, like actually run his damn credit like before you prejudge him, right? Like, yeah. and we've, I'm sure you guys have had sales where like, there's no way this guy can afford it. There's no way this guy's going to pass credit and you run his credit. And you're like, I've had that where I was like, really? Yeah, you're like, like, okay, right? And on the other hand, you had somebody who were like, oh, this guy's got all the money in the world. He's got perfect credit. Yeah. You're like, Re really? Yeah. <laughs> right? Talks to the worst. <laughs> okay. yeah. You're yeah. done signing and everything. Text like yeah. there. You're right. like, wait, you failed. Right, right. You're like, okay, can't do much. <coughs> so make a list of those stereotypes. And then uh, right next to them, write down people that have succeeded. I think that's a big one. Um, third one, uh, again, we've touched on this briefly before, uh, but it's just having systems for recruiting. Um, so doing systematic recruiting instead of hobby recruiting. I think what a lot of people do is they do hobby recruiting. Yeah. Or they do, you know, they'll go talk to somebody when they feel like it. Or if, if the sun comes up, you know, at this angle and I'll go talk to them or whatever. <laughs> If it's not so raining true. and it's weather, the weather is yeah. great. And if I happen to be on a double date with him once a year, you know, right, right. maybe it's we'll like, talk to him about yeah, it. Yeah, if my wife was nice to me, yeah. and then, or if my wife kicks me out, then I guess I'll just go recruit because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I don't know, you know. But I think we have to treat it just like a system, just like you guys do with sales. Uh, it has to be systematic. It has to be in your schedule. Uh, it has to be consistent. That you can count on. So... With that, I would just, you have to reverse engineer the results that you want. So we'll do something very small, like two to 300 recruited accounts, as an example. Um, I know some people think that's not a lot, but I think, I think those are the hardest 200 accounts you ever recruit, and those are the most important, because those two to 300 accounts that you get from the first five, six, seven reps will turn into, we'll turn into 500 accounts yeah. the following year, and 800 accounts. And 
So to me, that's super important. So let's just use a simple example of 200 recruiter accounts. We're like, all right, I get 200 recruiter accounts. That means I probably need to have five people or whatever it is end the summer. Like be real with your numbers. Don't, you know, and see that. I mean, sometimes people inf- like find all kinds every of Every single person is going to sell 150 and every single yeah. person is going to fill By the way, every company has the highest averages. Let's just yeah. get that out there. Every company I've ever talked to, they all GDD has have, the highest averages. They have the highest, highest averages. Whatever company you work with, they have the highest averages in the nation. There's no other company that competes. And you're like, statistically, it's not possible for them to be number one, yeah. right? So, but be real with the numbers. Like, don't inflate the numbers to make yourself feel better. It's like, okay, what's actually the real data? Yeah. First, first year rep that's never sold anything before. So, not even rookies that you bring over, right? Because sometimes people get called rookies, but they've yeah, ripped we're talking company. fresh new day. Yeah, new and you like fresh, fresh rookies, like those guys to analyze the data, not just people you sell from other companies. Numbers probably 35, 40 is probably yeah. my best guess. So, okay, so that means I need to have five people finish the summer. If I'm gonna have five people finish the summer, I'm probably gonna need more than five to start the summer. Mm-hmm. So the number in my estimation is probably close to 12 to 15 start the summer. Yeah. 12 to 15 start the summer. Well, that means how many people do you need to have that have attended three trainings? All right, so to deploy 15, I probably need to have throughout the year, maybe need to have 30 people that have come to those three trainings, or maybe it's 45, I don't know what numbers. Yeah. Uh, okay, to get somebody to do three trainings, uh, I probably need like a two to one ratio because you sign people and never show up to a training. All right, that means I need to sign maybe like 70, 80 people. To sign 70, 80 people, I need to sit down with X amount, you know, whatever the number is. And then you kind of work all the way back and you say, okay, so two to 300 recruiter accounts means I need to meet with, over the course of a year, about 100 guys. Okay, if I meet with 100 guys, it's just, I'll end up having X amount, they'll be interested. Yeah. And, and then you just work your way backwards. It's like, all right, if I want to sit down with 100 guys, that means I need to meet with whatever, seven a week during the off season or whatever the case is. So you can kind of do it that way and that's the way I'd recommend it because then your energy isn't, you see this guy, you get so excited, you're like, oh, this is the, the one. one, this yeah. is the one. Right? This one guy will do this, my 300. Right. By the way, and he's got so many friends, yes. Sam. He's going to recruit his family and you know, and there's so many of the leads, right? Because you can count on everyone, yes. there's seven siblings. So he's going to recruit his family and bro, he's got so many friends. I can't even tell you about He's going to recruit them all and that's what we're going to do 5,000. Um, so it allows you to kind of have that, like not get over excited. Cause when you get over excited, you're also setting yourself up for massive, massive disappointment. Yeah. Right. When it doesn't work out. So you just focus, I would just say when you focus on the top of the funnel numbers, I want to sit down next amount of people, then everything else naturally will work itself out. Uh, and this way when somebody does fall through the cracks, you're like, Oh yeah, he's just one of the guys that I knew was going to like, not, you didn't know that was going to be the guy. It was like, Oh, I was counting on X percent of people falling through the cracks. It was just happened to be that guy. Yeah. It's like, cool. Exactly. Just like when you're knocking. You, you expect to sell every single door. It's like, well, that's not true. When you're new, you probably talk to X amount of people and somebody's not interested. It doesn't catch you off guard. If you're like, oh yeah, I expected a certain amount of people to not yeah. be interested. I love that. So that's a big part of it. I mean, just being systematic with it, having a weekly schedule and put the things we talked about earlier, put them in your schedule, right? Like, when, when are the career fairs? When are you going to go to campus? But then you just do that on a consistent weekly basis yeah. like you would any other job. And then what's the fourth one? The fourth one is a good one. The fourth one is multiplying. Uh, so going back to the, I don't know if we talked about this before, but um, one of the reasons why I think recruiting is very valuable is because as a, as a salesperson, you're a value adder, right? You'll pick up accounts onesie, twosie, and you'll get paid very well for it. So you're a value adder. Um, the next level of adding value is being a value multiplier, meaning now, you can bring on other people around you, they can also contribute value. So Sam Taggart led to a lot more accounts than just what he sold because he was good at it, like multiplying value. Yeah. And the next level up is, you know, bringing on people like where you can multiply the multipliers, right? That's uh, something along the lines of what Maxwell talks about in his five levels of leadership. But uh, training people to be multipliers right from the beginning instead of just value adders. Yeah. And it goes back to the theme we started with, which is you have to do these things. Because everything I'm saying, we, you do them, with the right in, with the right intention, they go really far. You do it with the wrong intention, it just comes across as like a really sketchy thing you're doing. Yeah. So I've heard people talk about like, hey, you recruit guys and then you want to tap their network. You want to leverage their network um, so you can build your team. Like to me, that's not the right Bird, attitude, yeah. right? It's not the right it's not the right mentality because what you're telling yourself is I'm just going to tap into your little circle so it serves me. Instead of it, I think a better way to do it is even when you talk to people, just tell them like, hey, the reality is like you can be a great sales guy, but my goal for you isn't 
for you to just be a good sales guy. I want to help you become a manager. Um, and with that in mind, that's how you kind of go over like, let me tell you about how you can get started with team building. And the way I even talk to guys is like, guys, the easiest way to do this with team building is let's get some of your guys in the wheelhouse. Because we get them in the wheelhouse, I can train them or Sam can train them. We can train them to be good. And if and when you're ready, you'll already have a couple of veterans that have already done 100, 200 yes. accounts. They'll get to go with you. So that's a really big one. Multiplying, but multiplying with the right, with the right. It's attitude. there to serve them long term. Yeah, just and I think I want to make money off your friends. Right, and I think we never, nobody ever says that to people, but they can feel it. Oh, hundred you know, percent. Hey, just you know, make a list of fifty so I can call them so we can have a bigger team instead of like doing that. Let's go over like, hey, let let me give you a three year vision of what your opportunity here can look like, and that's a very common thing to sharp people. Yeah. You know, I always do a three to five year vision of where they can be and then you tie tie them multiplying back into it. That's powerful. Like if you're listening to this, it's like gold. Like I, I think it's so funny because you just broke it down into four simple pieces. You know, you have uh, multiplying your structure, you've got abundance and conviction you know what I mean and it's like you put those four things together it's like what makes a good recruiter and I think a lot of times people they fail to believe they're good recruiters but it's like if you're a good salesperson you should be a good recruiter you have conviction in your product are you abundant meaning you're not like oh they said no you got another door you you can apply that same, same mindset and I think it's like so cool to kind of cross like just tie the two together and be like just get your name out there. You're not going to recruit unless you're you're out there doing it. That's a big, big part of it. And the other thing is just having, like doing it systematically. Yeah. Like everyone that I've seen that's been successful in sales has their own system. You know, I remember yours was the, and I still use it by the way, the two questions, five requirements, right? Like the, I love it. It's like, and it, and it was an awesome thing that I learned from you. And even something as simple as like learning that from seeing, like when I shouted him, learn that, applied it. Right, and I was like, cool, I'm just gonna do things exactly the way Sam, like Sam's doing them because he's obviously doing great. Uh, when you're a bit, and I was like, he's doing great, this is awesome, I'm gonna do it the same way he's doing it. And then I sold two a day for like my first six days. Right? It was just like, and people were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just doing where the heck he's doing. And I'm just saying, if I could do, if I could just, I'm not Sam Taggart, I'm just using his systems. Yeah, right? it was a system, and I've used it in solar, I've used it in everything else. And it works. It works. And I guess it works, right? It's a crazy concept. But I think sometimes with uh, even like managers and companies, I, I would even take it to that level. Like I think just like we hand our sales reps systems for sales success, we need to get better at like handing them systems for recruiting success. Yes. Too many people are just all they're doing Nugget. is they're just like, hey man, just go, go, recruit. go recruit, right? I get that all the time. Like guys call me and they're like, hey, like, I've been trying to do this recruiting thing, but all of our have been told is like, go recruit and pretty much like, like essentially like scolding them. Like, what do you mean you can't? Right. And the only thing they've ever been taught is like, go talk to your friends. And But nobody look. handed them a system and said, do this, do this, do this, do right. this. So there's no, there's not enough of that. And I think if there was that, and I think even companies would explode because you'd have a lot of little two, 300 account teams popping up that would become five, 600 account teams. Yeah. So same thing with managers. I think it's our responsibility to hand our guys the systems for recruiting and team building. And you want to have systems that 80% of the marketplace can replicate. Yep. You know, your top 10%, they'll always do great. Your bottom 10% always do terrible. In this industry of recruiting, the only people that are doing it is the top 10% because they're the guys that figure out anywhere because they're so driven. But most people aren't. You can teach the, yeah, you teach that. You teach the middle 60 to 80%. That's big. So you need to have systems that work for the middle 60 to 80%. Not just like your top 10 guys that are the most charismatic that can probably... Yeah, you know, they can wing seven. it and it'll work. Right. So I want to finish. We kinda, we're kind of we running out of time. Um, are we good on the camera, Jonah? Um, so basically, I want to, I, I kind of want to tell the story of Amy because I think it's such an inspiring story. In it. And, and it's just she pops up on my, my feed and I see her post All her right, sales awesome. number and it's just like, what? Like... So I'll kind of start it and then I'll let you finish it. So we recruit this girl, Amy, and she comes in and what, blanks for probably a month? Like, I don't six know, weeks. Six weeks. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was like literally blanks. I'm like, what are we doing having this like, conversation? Possible, like, right? Yeah, six weeks, zero accounts. And I'm like, I wrote her off. Like I was just kind of like, 
I remember that call. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm I was like, like, dude, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. She's your problem. Go yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the call. It was, it was like, I can't sit here and keep like feeding her and, 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 and making it happen. So six weeks, no sales. She probably finished the whole summer with how many accounts? In her first six months, he did 19. 19 accounts in six months. Oh. And I thought, I'm like, why doesn't she just quit? Like, go home. Like, I literally was like, Amy, like, this job just isn't for you. <laughs> like, yeah, I think I had that conversation with her multiple times. And she's like, I got this. And get back on the horse. And she was always so positive. And it's like, how are you so positive when you stink? Like, it was so embarrassing. Yeah. So what's inspiring is the story because you kept with her and you invested and you said, look, I see she's staying positive. She worked. Like it wasn't like she sat on a curb every day. Right. Which that was the frustrating part. I'm like, you right. just are that bad. Right. <laughs> and Amy, I love you. That's why I'm giving you a shout out because right. how many accounts did she finish? Just, I guess we can fast forward, but this was what? Two, Four years, two ago? years ago. Two, two and a half or two and a half three years, years ago. ago that we had that summer. And then this last year. This last year, what'd she do? 314 for the year. 314. Right. What, like, so if I'm recruiting somebody, and, th and this is like where I think it's tied back to recruiting and let's tie it back to leadership. Sure. One, you never know. Yeah. And now she's your 300 account rep, probably salt of the earth, awesome, crushing she's it. Awesome. She's recruiting, I'm assuming. Yep. And it's like, I was like, I wrote her off. And, but what did you do over the three years to get her there? I'm, I'm just so curious. I think, um, first of all, credit goes to Amy because we know yeah, a lot of people I, that went through that, that would have just thrown up their hands. Yeah. You know? So I think it shows a lot of character in her. Um, I think a couple of things, like even when she first started, you know, we kind of hit home on the pain points. And the reality is, even when she was going through some of those, like the conversations we had were, here's all I know is if you just work hard and you have a good attitude, like you're not bringing the people down, you're working hard. As long as you do that, I'll never give up on you. I always say that to people. As long as you work hard and you're willing to have a good attitude if, and you're coachable and you're learning stuff. If you're, and I always tell people that if you do what I tell you to do and you work hard and you're a positive attitude and you don't succeed, then that's on me. That means I'm not a good enough leader. That means I'm not good enough at training. That means my training systems aren't good enough. That means there's things that are coming up that I didn't see coming. Like it yeah. has to, I have to own that, right? Because you're doing everything I'm telling you to do. So like, what the heck? That was one. The other thing was, um, a lot of the conversations went back to like what we talked about. It's like, hey, listen, I know things aren't great right now. Um, if you want, I'm going to stay committed to you and I'm going to help you keep getting better. And that meant taking calls at the end of the night, you know, so I was talking to her at like 10 p.m. often just kind of going over some role plays and, and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but she also knew in that with the way she was reduced, she knew her alternative was, hey, I can either like, re like this might stink for the next six months. This might stink for a year. But my alternative is if, is what? My life is going to stink for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right? So it was either that or go back to her job that she's making 50 grand a year and just repeat that over and over and over and over again. So I think I just have a really big time conviction. And this might suck for you for six <laughs> months. It might suck for you for a year. Um, but the alternative is if things suck for you forever. Yeah. So when you put that in perspective, it's a little bit easier to get through. And I also relate to college a lot. I'm like, hey, you go to four years of college, you pay them X amount, whatever that is, 50 grand, 100 grand. You give up four years of your life for a 25% chance of that, 50, whatever the percentage is of chance of that actually landing you a job that's going to pay you 70 grand or whatever it's going to pay you. Yeah. Um, Versus if you gave me four years of work ethic and positive attitude, I have zero doubt in my mind. You'd be killed in six figures, right? So I think those are a couple of things. And the other thing that I always focus on with everyone is this. Even if you stink, even if you're a zero out of 100 sales ability, if you just focus on getting 1% better every day, yeah. just 1%, like not as in for math, massive steps, you just get 1% better every day. Over time, even if you get half percent better in 100 to 200 days, you're going to be a pretty good rep. Yeah. So if you just keep things in perspective that you're just going to get 1% better every day, then it's easier to stay positive. And you just focus on, hey, I almost in that example, it's almost like I stink, 
but I stink less than I than I did last. Yeah. Right. 